pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. And I should mention we had a closed session, but there is uh, nothing to report out of that session. <clears throat> Rhonda, if you would call the roll, please. Council Member Bruins? Present. Council Member Daniels? Here. Council Member Turner, absent and excused. Vice Mayor Miller? Present. And Mayor Slowey? Present. This meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the Government Affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse cable systems. This meeting is closed caption and webcast at citrusheights.net. Today's meeting replays Monday, March 27th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. A DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is approval of the agenda. I move approval. <laughs> Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Next item, Rhonda, please. And the next item is presentations. Presentation four is Sacramento Yolo Mosquito and Vector Control District, and here to present is Gary Goodman. Good evening, Mr. Goodman, and I promised you we'd have more than 12 people, so you're Yeah, I know. Thank you good. very much. I appreciate that. So I was also told to, uh, to make sure that your stand works and raise it up a little bit. So, okay. Um, oh, I thought the room was slow going. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So, well, thank you again to the council for inviting us out to talk a little bit about uh, mosquito control specifically and, and West Nile virus, which is obviously going to be a concern for us uh, this year as well. Uh, this is kind of our annual uh, touch base to, to try to give you an idea as to what we're anticipating for this upcoming season. And so, um, in general, our district uh, is both Sacramento and Yolo County. Our main office is down in Elk Grove. Uh, we also have a satellite office in Woodland that covers operations for Yolo County. And we're very diverse from the perspective of we have a lot of population here in Sacramento County, and then right on the other side of the river or even in the Tomas or down in the Delta, we have a lot of agriculture. So we tend to have a lot of mosquitoes that are produced in some of our outlying areas that have a direct impact on all of our population centers. Mosquitoes don't just necessarily stay where they're born, they fly. Um, and so we're a very diverse session, especially in Yolo County. We have pockets of like Woodland and Davis and Winter, small populations that are surrounded 100% um, by, by agriculture that produces a tremendous amount of mosquitoes. So some mosquito habitats for us are very easy to spot. Uh, when you look out on the causeway now, you see all the flooding. When you go out into any agricultural area, you'll see a lot of lowlands and a lot of water based on the recent rains that we've had. And so a lot of sites are very easy for us to see. Wetlands, rice fields, irrigation ditches, those types of things are very easy for us to spot. And obviously we're anticipating a very busy year this year with the amount of rain that we've had uh, so far uh, in, the, in the last couple of months. The harder things for us to find are the backyard sources, the green swimming pools, uh, small buckets, toys, those types of things. And especially with the amount of rain that we've had over the past couple of months, a lot of those things that are in people's backyards have now filled up with water. And that's not something uh, that they're necessarily going around on a regular basis and dumping out, especially in the springtime when they don't anticipate to see a whole lot of mosquito activity. So one of the messages that we always have in trying to uh, incorporate the public is to try to make sure that they're going around their yard once a week, especially after the rains that we just recently had. You're going to have these containers that, uh, that you may have forgotten about in your yard that are going to fill up with water. And it really only takes about a week or so for the mosquitoes to find that, and then another week or so for those mosquitoes to emerge as adults. And so we want to make sure that we're soliciting the public's help and being able to try to help find some of these more cryptic or difficult sources for us to find because we can't really see in people's backyards. Can't see through the fence, can't see on the other side of the, uh, of the house. And so this is a big issue for us. So our program really encompasses what we call kind of six levels of, uh, of mosquito control or integrated mosquito management. The first is public education, public information. We have a very aggressive advertising program. Uh, we do television and radio, print. Uh, we try to get news stories uh, to make sure that the media is covering our events and, of course, social media aspects of just trying to get the message out. We do a lot of neighborhood associations. We have a school program and go to a lot of events. In fact, that we'll be planning on coming to your 20th anniversary uh, event in June uh, to make sure that we're getting the information out for the people that need it uh, so that they know how not to breed mosquitoes in their own property, and then of course protecting themselves um, from getting mosquito bites and specifically West Nile virus. Then we go into our surveillance program, which essentially is we set traps throughout the district.
district, um, pick them up on a daily and weekly basis, and count those traps to see what type of abundance that we're having in any particular area. Is the population rising? Is it declining? And of course, we're testing those mosquitoes specifically for West Nile virus. And then if we have virus activity, then we're mobilizing our troops into that particular area to try to contain it in as, in as small an area as possible. Then we have our biological control program. Um, our district down in Elk Grove has 23 ponds dedicated towards breeding mosquito fish. Uh, very small fish look like guppies um, and do an excellent job of taking care of mosquito larvae. So we plant these fish in places like rice fields or wetlands, but even backyard swimming pools, bird baths, whatever uh, 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 area that they might be effective in, we'll put those fish in and that's a free of charge service. So we want to make sure that we're going out to those areas. We plant about 4,000 pounds of fish per year. We're probably the largest mosquito fish breeding facility in the country. Um, and so we're very proud of that program, but uh, we want to make sure that the public is aware of that, that program as well. Then we go into physical control, and we have some heavy equipment at our facility, a backhoe and dump truck, and we try to work with landowners, um, specific wetland owners, uh, farmers, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California uh, Department of Wildlife, uh, Fish and Wildlife, in making sure that they're managing their, proper, their property appropriately to reduce mosquito breeding on that. So that's another service that we provide. And then, of course, we get into our control program, which is our technicians go out into a particular area. We have one assigned here into the Citrus Heights area. They're here every single day, and they're looking for and treating mosquito breeding sources as they find them. And when we do get adult mosquito control, so our traps start to go higher, we start to get uh, virus activity in a particular area, then we'll implement our adult mosquito control program, which includes ground rigs, uh, backpacks, ATVs, trucks, and then of course even airplane, which we have had a history of doing in this particular area in response directly to West Nile virus. So a little bit, I've been talking about West Nile, but there are other diseases that mosquitoes carry. Um, West Nile is the most prevalent mosquito-borne disease that we have here in the United States, but we've also in, in the U.S. have had outbreaks of, not here in California, but in dengue fever, uh, chikungunya, obviously Zika is in the news, and then of course at this time of year is dog heartworm. Um, next month actually is dog heartworm awareness month, um, and so in the springtime, uh, you get a species of mosquitoes that can transmit dog heartworm, and we want to make sure that people are aware that it's not just necessarily human diseases that mosquitoes can transmit, um, but dog heartworm is a big one, and especially at this time of the year, the beginning of springtime. So as a general history of West Nile virus activity in California over the past few years, you can see it first was reported in, in the United States in 1999 in New York City, and then within four years steadily made its way across the country. Uh, and in 2004 was really centered down in Southern California, but here in, in um, uh, Northern California, 2005 was the big issue for us, so the, the most number of cases. That's where we had 880 cases. And then you can see the numbers kind of decline quite a bit. And then the last couple of years, actually 2014, 2015, a big resurgence of human cases. And we attribute that a lot to the drought which is a little bit counterintuitive. You would think, well, if you have less water, you'll have less mosquitoes. And that may be true, but because West Nile is a bird disease, um, it's vectored by mosquitoes. So wherever you did have water in those drought years, you had the congregation of both birds and mosquitoes in the same place. And what happened, it tended to amplify the virus activity that we saw, which is why we saw the high number of human cases over the last couple of years. Last year, we had better rains or a little bit better drought situation, especially early on in the season, and our numbers tended to drop down. So we're hoping that uh, possibly while we may have more mosquito breeding sources this year with the amount of water, we may actually have less virus activity, which would be a good thing for us. Uh, but one thing I do want to mention on the number of cases is these numbers um, conceivably could be seen as small, but these are only the reported number of cases. So West Nile virus is a disease that tends to get underreported because if you experience symptoms, uh, you may not ever go to the doctor, your doctor may not ever diagnose it, and so you have about anywhere from 30 to 70 cases uh, more that go unreported for all of the reported cases. And so you're really talking about tens of thousands of people that are afflicted just in California on an annual basis. So I wanted to give just a, a overview, a little bit of what we saw last year in terms of West Nile virus uh, in, the, in, in the area, specifically within Citrus Heights, your boundary there. Uh, the uh, triangles are West Nile virus positive bird locations that we saw, and then the circles are positive mosquito samples. So actually within Citrus Heights, we did very well, but you could see the surrounding area um, quite a bit more of virus activity associated with that. 
Um, so what are we anticipating for 2017? Obviously, everybody's asking about the rains uh, and what is that going to do for us? Well, yeah, it's expanded the amount of breeding sources that we've seen. So we see a lot of these agricultural sources. We're active now. We are starting to see now as the weather started to warm up here at the end of March, we're starting to see a little bit more of uh, mosquito breeding activity. Um, luckily, at this moment in time, virus activity tends not to amplify until we get into really warmer months, May, June, and July. And so hopefully we're getting a good handle on this early on. And will help be able to suppress some of those West Nile virus activity numbers moving forward. I did want to mention uh, briefly, we have, uh, and I think I mentioned this last year as well, we have some invasive mosquito species that are starting to wake, make their way into California, specifically the Asian tiger mosquito and the yellow fever mosquito um, are starting to get mos uh, populations established, specifically down in Southern California, but even as close to us as Fresno and Madera, which is a very similar climate to what we have here in Sacramento. And so this is a concern because these particular species of mosquitoes transmit dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus, which has been in the news recently. Um, and, uh, and we want to make sure that we're doing appropriate enough surveillance to be able to look for these spe species and then eradicate them if at all possible. Uh, so we've been doing ongoing surveillance for these for the last four years. We've yet to detect it within our boundaries. It doesn't mean that they're not here, uh, but this is a concern because conceivably this could lead to local transmission of some of these diseases. So I just wanted to touch base a little bit on Zika uh, just because it's in the news so much over the past couple of years. Um, again, first detected in Uganda in 1947. Similarly, West Nile virus was detected in Uganda in 1937, 10 years prior to that. Um, transmitted by those two species of mosquitoes specifically, and we've had local cases um, in California uh, and in Sacramento County specifically of Zika. Um, typically, there are people that have traveled to a Zika endemic area, gotten bitten by mosquito, and then came back here and then started to exhibit symptoms. And so that's the concern that if we were to get these types of mosquito species um, established here in our area, then essentially that mosquito could bite that infected person and then pass that on, uh, which essentially is how these things kind of uh, amplify on themselves. And so, uh, so obviously that's a concern for us. The one other complicating, and Zika's getting a lot of news, um, uh, just because of the impact on birth defects. So before, uh, before Brazil, about in 2004, Zika was always considered a relatively minor disease. You got sick for a few days, you recovered, never led to death, never had any other complicating factors. Now that they've made this link to the birth defect issue, uh, is it starting to get a little bit more news and making a significant issue um, for, for us. And so again, uh, we've had cases in California, we've had cases here in Sacramento County, and we want people to be aware of what their general risks are. So what do we ask the public to do? So we try to follow what we call 7Ds, uh, the district 7Ds. Obviously, drain any standing water in, in your, on your property. If you can go around to your yard once a week, make sure that anything that's holding water just gets dumped out. Uh, if uh, dawn and dusk are times to avoid being outdoors, that's when mosquitoes tend to be most active, and that's when they're looking to try to bite. So uh, if you can avoid being out time during out. Uh, Avoid being outdoors during that time, that would be ideal. If you do have to be outside, dress in long pants and long sleeves. I know sometimes that's tough in the middle of summer in Sacramento with 105 degree days. Uh, but if you can't do that, then defend yourself with a repellent. So uh, we buy repellent by the pallet. We buy a ton of it. Uh, we make it available uh, for anyone who wants to use it. All they have to do is contact us. So if you have some public events that you're dealing with, just give us a call. We'll be more than happy to drop it off or make arrangements for pickup. Uh, we want it to be used out in the field. So we see it very similarly almost to sunscreen. You know, 20 years ago, uh, people weren't quite using sunscreen. Then you started to get the risks associated with skin cancer, and now it's a little bit more part of people's routine. We want people to get to that point uh, with repellent as well. Uh, the other D, doors and screens should be in good working condition. So I know a lot of times I like to open up our windows in the evening time, let the delta breeze come through to cool the house off. Uh, mosquitoes are very small and essentially they're picking up the carbon dioxide that you exhale. Um, or when I'm snoring, I guess, uh, they, they pick that up. So you want to make sure your doors and screens are in good working order so the mosquitoes can't find you. Um, and, and even just those little small holes need to be patched up. And then the last D is what we have is district personnel. If you're being bothered by mosquitoes, if you see mosquitoes, if you have questions about that, um, if you know of a neighbor that has a bad pool or just see standing water, call us. Typically we come out that day. We have a mobilization crew that can actually come out that afternoon um, or at the very latest the next day. Uh, so we want to make sure that the, the earlier that we can try to tackle the problem, the better off it will be for all of us long term. Uh, so again, uh, calling the district personnel. So you can get more information on our website at uh, fightthebite.net and then our phone number 1-800-429-1022. And with that, does the...
Council have any questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Goodman, for the presentation. <clears throat> I can say, well, I know all of us up here know a um, person here in Citrus Heights who got West Nile virus, and it, the thing that was amazing to me was how it, you know, not only affected this person, but the recovery time was quite long. In Absolutely. Fact, I'm not 100% sure she's quite done with the process, but um, it, it, it's out there. Um, you know, it doesn't discriminate, and uh, appreciate your presentation. Yeah. Folks, any comments or questions for Mr. Goodwin? At, at the risk of coming down with these symptoms, what are the symptoms? The, the symptoms of West Nile um, are similar to the flu, and so that's where people tend to mistake what, what the, uh, mistake it with the flu in and of itself, and that's where it tends to somewhat get some, kind of minimized from that perspective. And so it's nausea, it's headache, joint pain, it's that worst part of the flu. Um, so, you know, with the flu, you kind of feel crummy for a couple of days, you think you've got something, then you feel really bad, you're in bed for a few days, and then a couple of days you start to recover and then you get better. And so think of the worst part of the flu lasting for maybe just three days and your body recovers, or it could last for weeks on end. I think that's the exact point with West Nile is that... Um, is that these types of symptoms can last for a long time. So specifically, we tend to have virus activity in the summertime. So we start to pick up West Nile virus activity in May, and it typically goes through September and a little bit into October, and so that tends to, to shoulder. So if you're exhibiting flu-like symptoms during those months, that would be something to yeah, potentially talk to your doctor flu about. season. Yeah. Um, and is it diagnosed with a simple blood test? Simple blood test, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You know, uh, question. In the does the medical community routinely uh, test for this now? I mean, they didn't in the beginning, and that's why, it, you know, cases got so bad, I think. It, it, um, it tends to get, and as I mentioned, it tends to get underreported because there is no vaccine or antiviral or anything else that somebody can take that will essentially knock out the symptoms. So it tends to be supportive care. So I don't want to say that the doctors... They're looking for what are the solutions and not necessarily what, are the, what is the cause. So what, how can I do symptomatic care to try to make you feel better? And so if you were to come in saying, boy, this flu seems to be lasting long for a couple weeks, what's going on? They may then start to think, well, it, you know, it's July. Yeah, maybe that's a bigger concern. Let's do the test. But even if you do get the test, now that you know, there isn't really anything you can do about it. Your body does, just has to start to react and, and recover from that. And as, as you mentioned, the time can take a long time. The uh, uh, CDPH, California Department of Public Health, did a survey back in 2006 of a number of folks that were affected by West Nile virus, exhibited symptoms from West Nile virus. And over 50% of those people still exhibited some level of symptom a year after being infected. So some people recover very quickly, um, which is great, but then some people that, 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 that lingers. And so that has an impact on your family, on your work life, on just in your general well-being. And so we want to make sure that people are aware that this is a very serious disease and there are simple measures that you can take to try to prevent it. Again, drain standing water, call the district when you're seeing mosquitoes, and use a good repellent to make sure that you're not being bitten. Thank you. I did want to want yep. to. Uh, I, I know you all know Dr. Jana, but uh, she is on our board, been on our board for quite some time, and uh, uh, she's got a nice Beat Zika uh, T-shirt on there. Well, but they couldn't fit chicken gunya. On they there. couldn't fit chicken gunya yeah. on the T-shirt. <laughs> Um, but she's always a wonderful advocate for both the district and obviously Citrus Heights in, in making sure that we're attending events that are in your neighborhood that have an impact on your citizens um, and definitely want to thank her for her service. She represents us well there. Yes, she she's is. into yes. mosquitoes. Uh, since this is the district update, I wanted to just supplement what he said is that, because I know a lot of people that watch our meetings, uh, we do offer also um, yellow jacket control for people who have you know, been swarmed with their yellow jackets in their yard. And also we do tick surveillance to measure ticks for uh, those that carry Lyme disease. Okay. Um, so we do all that. Our district is uh, very efficient at what we do, I think. Did you guys cut down trees? I, I need some tree <laughs> Not yet. Not okay. yet. We'll work on that, though. Just that I'd ask that yeah. you were right. throwing out all sorts of good services. Yeah. Right. Those great yeah. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you for coming tonight. All right, next item, please. <clears throat> next item are comments by council members and regional board updates. All right, we'll start with Mr. Daniels first. Um, went to an air quality board meeting today, uh, mostly techno stuff. Uh, the air is good. Okay. And um, um, budget stuff, and so not too much to report, but uh, your money is being spent. Good air and good spending of our money. That's can't complain about that. Miss Bruins. Well, I don't have any reports because uh, sanitation district did not meet um, 
this week, but I do have a couple things I wanted to bring up in regard to some legislation that is going through the process. And um, I, if there is consensus, I'd like to suggest that the council um, support this. The first one is AB 1326 by Assemblyman Cooper, Jim Cooper, who used to be on the Elk Grove City Council. And it's called the Aggregate Valuation um, uh, bill. It has to do with theft and is in response to to AB 47. And so, um, basically, what this bill will do right now, as as the law stands, each in each incident of theft under $950 stands on its own and, and is a misdemeanor. And the result of that is that guns and drugs can be stolen, and it's just a misdemeanor. This bill would make it um, aggregate an aggregate within the 12-month period. If the aggregate amount of all these smaller thefts equals 950, then it can be um, tried as a, it could be seen as a felony, and it will strengthen um, the tools our law enforcement will have to get these folks off the street. So, I'm bringing it up today um, to see if we have some consensus from the council on this, or if you want it to be brought back for a formal vote. I'm fine uh, if we want to write a letter of support. A letter, yeah, a letter of support. I don't okay. think we need any presentations, right? No. Okay, thank you. And then the other one um, that I just got today, I think we all got it um, from the, the league, had to do with the transportation funding to, to support that bill going forward. Um, if there are any thoughts, if there are any thoughts on that, I'm trying to pull it up as I talk. SB1. Hang on a second. I think it's a different one. Let me just pull it up real quick. It is um, it's, it's uh, da, 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 da. the transportation, uh, basically it's the final package. There's, they're not citing a particular, yeah, SB1 and AB1. Yeah, those SB1 and AB1 for transportation funding. And the way it's written, um, that there could be substantial funding coming down to the city level, and we could use that to maintain our roads and make our transportation system um, more travel-worthy. So any thoughts on that one? Uh, my thought is I don't, I, I've heard so many different versions of it, I'd, I'd actually have to see what the Wanna final. Wait and see? Okay. O only because I know a lot of it is, you know, we're raising taxes, et cetera, taxes. and I just, I need to see what the final is. Okay. Is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that then. Okay. So my main concern was on AB 1326. Thank you for that. And I have nothing further to report this time. Okay. And, and I didn't mean the gentleman on the transportation, please feel free to speak up. No, I'm with you on that one. Okay. All right, Mr. Miller. Um, pretty easy schedule. A week ago, Monday, March 13th, we had a regional transit meeting. Of note was uh, the approval and authorization of the general manager to execute an MOU regarding the governance of the regional connect card transit system and the ability to use the same card. It's, I don't know how many years it's been trying to get this thing rolled out, and I think we've done the beta testing and all that. and. Uh, so I think it's close to being actually issued for uh, the public's use. And that'll allow you to go between YOLO and Sacramento, El Dorado Transit. Um, I forget all the different uh, uh, transit agencies, but there's about seven that uh, this will work, work with. And I'm also in the process of scheduling over the, this month and the next two months a presentation of regional transit um, strategic vision with each of our neighborhood associations. So we'll be making the rounds. And that's all I have to report. Okay, uh, only one board meeting, SACOG. The big item on the agenda um, actually kind of fell apart at the last minute. It was going to be on bike share. Um, bike share in itself, I, I think, is a good thing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily work for Citrus Heights, but when you look at like downtown Sacramento, West Sacramento, Davis, a lot of bike riders, a lot of places you can ride to, and essentially it is bikes strategically placed around the city at locking hubs. You can pull them up on your phone, find a bike, go pay for, you know, by the hour. Um, there is some seed money that SACOG was gonna put up. All set to vote and a new player came in um, completely out of the blue. Three days earlier had uh, offered uh, 
SACOG was looking at spending $3 million to seed 900 bikes. This company offered 800 bikes in one city, no cost, no annual cost. They would take care of everything, and all they needed was an overlying agreement with the city so that if somebody parked the bike in the wrong spot and, say, locked it to a fire hydrant as opposed to properly, <clears throat> the city wouldn't be rushing out there to impound it, you know, to keep the company's costs lower. So. I still think there's going to be bike share um, throughout the region. It might look a little different. So rather than uh, vote to spend money on bikes um, with other companies offering just the same amount roughly for free, um, they decided after two years to take a step back and let West Sacramento deal a little further uh, with this company. So they're a new company, so there's a few you know, issues there. But it uh, be interesting. I, I think one way or the other, uh, bike share will come to many parts of the region. Uh, most of us <laughs> attended uh, the uh, Citrus Heights Marching Band Spaghetti Fee. That was a good, uh, good event, a good fundraiser for them. So thanks to everybody who came. Uh, the only other thing I have is a reminder uh, specifically for Citrus Heights residents, Saturday, April 8th, uh, 8 to 1 p.m. in the back of Sunrise Mall is the free household hazardous waste drop-off. Um, they prefer that you call them and make uh, an appointment, but you don't have to. You can just pull up on your own. Um, if you'd like to call, it's 1-800-CLEANUP. But again, it's being sponsored by Sunrise Mall and Republic Services. Um, there also is a farmer's market that day, and they're going to do a free composting workshop. So uh, good stuff if you're into vermiculture and traditional composting. I believe one of my fellow council members won a vermiculture composting kit in the past, so she's into worms. Was. Uh, was into, did they all die? Did you kill all the worms? <laughs> oh, man. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview, oh, quick overview of acceptable materials and unacceptable, and then we'll be done. So household chemicals and cleaners, auto fluids, except motor oil, acids, pesticides, gasoline, plant, paints and solvents, vehicle batteries, and fluorescent lamps and tubes. They will not accept ammunition, explosives, pharmaceuticals, radioactive material, or used motor oil, which all makes sense. But again, April 8th, Citrus Heights residents, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. You don't have to have an appointment, but it'll go quicker if you do. That's 1-800-CLEANUP. That's it. Next item, please. Next item is public comment. Under Government Code Section 54954.3, members of the audience may address the Council on any item of interest to the public and within the Council's purview, or on any agenda item before or during the Council's consideration of the item. If you wish to address the Council during the meeting, please fill out a speaker identification sheet and give it to the City Clerk. When you are called upon to speak, step forward to the podium and state your name for the record. Normally, speakers are limited to five minutes each, with 30 minutes being allowed for all comments. Any public comments beyond the initial 30 minutes may be heard at the conclusion of the agenda, and the mayor has the discretion to lengthen or shorten the allotted times. Thank you, Rhonda. So we have five speaker sheets. Uh, I'll call them in the order that I got them. You'll have five minutes. Uh, if you don't need five minutes, uh, feel free not to take it. But uh, first one, Don Fairbrother followed by Margaret Kafka. Welcome, Don. Good evening, Mayor Slowy, Vice Mayor Miller, Council members. My name is Don Fairbrother, and I live on Cobalt Way in Citrus Heights. I am going to read you a letter that I have written, and you'll have to forgive me, public speaking is not my forte. And afterwards, I have a couple of additional comments I want to make. I have been a homeowner in the city of Citrus Heights for over 15 years. First off, I want to tell you I love my community. I've been a member of REACH as well as the Neighborhood Association. I have volunteered in different community events within the city and have been a member of the Citrus Heights Community Emergency Response Team. I'm coming to you this evening to let you know of a growing problem in my area, specifically on Cobalt Way and the adjacent streets. Since I have lived here, I have personally had my house broken into twice. My boyfriend's car has been broken into once. My neighbor to the right has had his truck broken into three times. My neighbor to the left has had his house broken into. Four houses down from me, they've had two motorcycles taken. 
We've experienced miscellaneous graffiti, petty yard theft, and a bus stop on the corner of Cobalt and Auburn that is in continuous disrepair within the last year. I have personally called the police no less than three times due to excessive speed and reckless exhibition on Cobalt and Kittery, once of which almost hit my fence as the driver lost control and drove over my neighbor's lawn. At that time, they brought me a they brought out a speed trailer to put in front of my house to help slow the traffic. I have also called or I also called numerous times on the 4th of July weekend due to loud and large illegal fireworks on my street. Since the first of the year, I've, we have had two trucks stolen in our neighborhood, and as of Tuesday, we've had our first shooting. These are just a handful of the incidents that I am personally aware of. After speaking with my neighbors, there are many, many more. I'm here to ask you, at the very least, to gather data and look at the statistics in our area and compare them with the other areas of Citrus Heights and take action based on that data. My concern is our area is slowly becoming the next Sayonara of Citrus Heights. Lastly, this is my home. This is my investment. But more importantly, this is my community. And I am asking you to help me make Cobalt Way, Citrus Heights, a place that I want to continue to live. What I additionally want to say is I want to thank Lieutenant Russo because once he found out that I was frustrated and very concerned, he immediately, very proactively, reached out to me to see what he could do to give me information that would help me understand what is going on. I am not here complaining about response. Every time I have called the police, whether it be for speeding, whether it be for any type of issue like that, they've responded immediately. Every time I have called the city, general services for a loose dog, for graffiti, for the bus stop, they have responded immediately. That is not the problem. What I am looking for is to get data so that we can do some statistical analysis to do some rate, root cause to find out what is actually going on in that neighborhood so we can do some prevention. It's, it's not the response. The, once the horse is out of the barn, that's great. I want to keep the horse in the barn. That's what I'm here for. Thank you very much for listening to my concerns. <coughs> Thank you, Don. And I know I was going to say I know you've been in contact with Jason, so we'll let we'll let that process work through because I know they're doing some work behind the scenes for it. Yes. So thank you. Thank uh, you. Coming forward, Margaret Kafka, followed by Kathy Morris. Evening, Margaret. Good evening. I'm Margaret Kafka. My last name is spelled K-A-F-F-K-A. -F -F -A. Uh, first off, I thank the council for granting five minutes of me expressing my opinion. This is the first time I've spoken before the council, so please do not take anything I say personally. That's the qualifier. <laughs> Several months ago, I saw a meeting on TV in which the issue of whether to obtain body cameras for our officers was discussed. It concluded when council members unanimously agreed that body cameras were not needed in Citrus Heights for we did not have the problems other communities had. This decision was made upon very little information in my opinion, about body cameras. One council member asked what a body camera looked like. So it is my suggestion that the body camera issue be reactivated or revisited with a more informative presentation. We need to familiarize ourselves with a body camera and how to properly operate it and adapt it to our unique community. The more 
factual information, the better our decision making. You may wonder how I became interested in body cameras. A few weeks after the council discussions, I was informed that a Citrus Heights officer shot and killed a resident in the line of duty and the department was in need of a witness. I immediately thought that if the officer involved was wearing a body camera, it may have helped to reveal some truth in the situation, perhaps even more accurate than what a witness could provide. Then the $2 million lawsuit followed and then the article in the Sacramento Bee. Police in Sacramento suburb of Citrus Heights have the highest fatal shooting rate in California. I say enough is enough. Don't you think? Instead of paying off lawsuits, we could be spending that taxpayer money on officer training, equipment, an entire host of improvements. I would like to know if anything has been done in this area, because I don't attend the meetings all the time, uh, and I would like to be updated. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. The short answer is no. <clears throat> um, Fully trust our police officers. At this time, we're not talking about body cameras. I, I won't comment on the B article because they're obviously trying to sell papers versus, quote, necessarily the correct facts. <clears throat> but uh, the short answer is no, we're not continuing to look at body cameras at this time. Thank you. You're welcome. Kathy Morris, followed by David Warren. And Mr. Warren, you didn't put down if it was an agenda item or just, OK, so we'll call you now. Hi, I'm Kathy Morris, and uh, I live obviously in Citrus Heights. I have the fortune, good or bad, I'm not sure, of being the lowest house in my neighborhood. So that means whenever there's a big storm and the drains clog up, guess who gets flooded? In the front yard. My, if I forget to sandbag, it's in my garage, and if I happen not to be home, it's in my house. Okay. I also have the good fortune to have a wonderful creek running in my backyard which obviously means if there's a good flood, I get a grand pond in the backyard. I'm here to commend the city of Citrus Heights for the excellent job you did and are still doing on this past um, storm. The, the trucks were out on the streets keeping the drains clear. I didn't even get a chance to get out there with my rake to clean the drains because they were clear. The creeks were running so that you kept the, with GSA or whoever it is, kept the clogs from happening so the creeks kept running. So I barely even flooded. And so I'm not the only one. And most of the time when we flood and all those things happen, we have someone to blame. Well, there's no one to blame because you did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will make sure that our general services departments passes that along to uh, their staff. And uh, again, <clears throat> you know, I would think all the council e echo that as well. We haven't uh, typically when there's really bad storms, we'll hear about some issues, but haven't heard of any this year. So that's great. So thank you, Mr. Warren. And followed by Arthur. You didn't put your name on it, Arthur. So, but we'll call you anyways. Did I get a full five? <laughs> yeah. Did <clears throat> um, my name is David Warren. Uh, there are two issues I wish to address. I would originally only come to address one, but since it was brought up this evening, I hope the City Council will reconsider and not support Cooley AB 1326. Although there is a criminal problem all through the state, the consequence of AB 1326 is to transfer the authority from the State of California and the Department of Corrections for the early release of felons to a three-judge federal panel. The state prison system at this time is closing in on 137% of um, design capacity that the federal courts have allowed the state to have. When that number is, is exceeded, the three-judge federal panel will decide who is to be released from prison instead of the Board of Parole hearings and the state of California. 
yes, there is an issue. Proposition 57 passed in order to make sure that only the people of the state of California made that decision. Mr. Cooley's bill does not uh, improve the problem, it aggravates the problem. Granted, misdemeanors are a continuing problem, but to create an overcrowding situation in our state prison system exacerbates the criminal activity in our community because the longest serving or possibly the most dangerous will be released unbeknownst to our community because the people who will be doing the releasing will be picking them by number, not by criminal commitment. Second, I would like to reinforce the earlier comments about body cameras. I think my strong belief, and I've addressed this to the police chief, is that our police department should not be tried by press. And my experience with the police department is such that it has been very interesting, and, most, and in most instances, I have had no problems whatsoever. It's a few disagreements, but that's to be expected. But the purpose of the body cameras is not for civil actions. It's not to defend the city. It's for the protection of police officers. The statistics show that police officers who are wearing body cameras de-escalate tense situations because the person that knows they're on candid camera tends to not be as excited when the officer points out everything you're saying is being recorded. We have a deputy sheriff who was shot and killed in South County. To this day, his murder has not been solved. If there had been a camera on that officer, the, per the perpetrator would have been recorded and that person would have been brought to justice. Now, I spent 30 years defending people accused of murder. My view of the criminal system is to guarantee not the civil rights of the accused, but for everyone else. So there's a standard by which no one kicks in your door, just like the Judge Dredd comics said, I know you did it, you're tried, and now I'm going to execute sentence. It is very difficult for police officers on the street in split to make split-second decisions and to have other people play Monday morning quarterback a year later, six months later. A recording will guarantee that police officers are protected. When I first started practicing law, I started in San Diego County, and I recall when the Bubba-type deputy sheriff stopped every young man with long hair or an afro or someone driving a VW bus, just, and that was the probable cause. Our police officers now are well-educated, they're very effective, and they're among the best. But it is the accusations that will be made against them which will deteriorate their standing in the community. We should not be reactive to a situation because there will come a time, unfortunately, where there will be an incident where it will be in dispute whether or not the officer acted correctly. If we are proactive, we will protect the reputation of all police officers in this community. And that's my goal, is to make sure they remain respected. I see too many people in the prison systems as a volunteer chaplain that are not immoral, they're amoral. They have no value system. And we need to protect our community and the police officers from those individuals. Body cameras are a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. <clears throat> Arthur, you're our last speaker, sir. My name is Arthur Kitterling. And I uh, just wanted to ask mainly for, uh, are you going to have something on the agenda with the dot with with the dot with the dog li licenses? I know that there was something mentioned about that. Well, we're having something with the SPCA tonight, but not necessarily dog licenses. We had a presentation last meeting uh, just to get some direction to them, but yeah. um, nothing new on that. Nothing new? No. Okay. And uh, I was only, another thing is, just was wanting, wanting to know about Mel Turner. Mel is doing uh, well. Okay. Under circumstances, he's... Doing well, thank you. Thanks. For that's me. that's good. Okay, th and thank you. Thank you, Arthur. <clears throat> Sorry about the name. 
Hey, that's right. I just, <clears throat> fortunately, we know who you are. So. <laughs> all right, those are all the speaker sheets I have. Anybody uh, out there last minute? All right, we'll move on to the next item. Rhonda, please. Next item is the consent calendar. It is recommended that all consent items be acted on simultaneously unless separate discussion and or action are requested by a council member. So our one item is approval of the minutes. Anybody have any changes, corrections, or want to make a motion? Move approval. Move approval by everyone. Do we have a second by someone? A second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries 4-0. Next item, please. Next item is public hearing. Subject is Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report to HUD on the 2016 Community Development Block Grant CDBG. Good evening, ladies. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Nicole Piva, Housing and Grants Program Technician, and Catherine Cooley, Development Specialist with the Community and Economic Development Department. Uh, we're here tonight to present an annual report the report in front of you is called the CAPER. It's a consolidated annual performance evaluation report. It'll describe our goals and our objectives, um, how we spent our funds in 2016. The majority of our funds come from HUD, um, a community economic or community um, development block program, which are called our CBG funds. In 2016, we received a little um, under $600,000, and with those funds, we uh, served over 8,000 people that received public service programs. 99% of those that were served were low income, and over 900 people served were considered to have a special need. Um, HUD considers someone with a special need to either be a senior, disabled, a female head of household, or a family of five or more persons. Our CDBG funds, um, some of them go towards our public service programs. In 2016, we provided funding to these nonprofits. A variety of services were provided um, after school programs, senior meals, housing counseling, we have a juvenile diversion education program. The column on the right is the number of persons each one of these nonprofits served during the 2016 year. Uh, you'll see that Sunrise Christian Food Ministry served over 7,000 people. Uh, this was a great organization to work with. They were a first time CDBG awardee in 2016. Uh, they're an emergency food closet. They served over 7,000 low-income Citrus Heights residents. They are all volunteers. Uh, nobody is paid. And those volunteers go out daily to our local churches, our organizations, um, some local businesses, and they collect donations, food donations, and they come back to the site and organize everything and distribute to those two that are in need of, of food. Here's kind of a collage of pictures of the inside of what Sunrise Christian Food Ministry looks like. Uh, they are located off of San Juan, just behind the Lutheran Advent Church, and they provide service five days a week. Um, it's a great organization. They served a lot of people. With um, our CBG funds, we also completed a citywide accessibility improvement project. Ten locations throughout the city received improvements. I have a few photographs of some accessibility that was done in, on Gumwood and Picnic. Another accessibility ramp on Sandalwood and Baymore. And then we had some sidewalk improvements on Parish Way. So with that, we would like to recommend council hear public comment and to direct staff to file this report with HUD. The only comment I have on the report is, I mean, I mean, can you go back to the numbers for everybody? And, and again, all these organizations do great things. Um, I, I question, and again, not the organization at all, but when I look at, you know, when I look at the amount of money we gave or spent, in, in particular Sunrise Christian Food Ministry, it was probably 20-ish thousand or so. Is that 7,450 total what they served? Because what I would like 
to know, you know, when I look at Meals on Wheels, for example, I know those are specific Citrus Sites residents that they've delivered to. <laughs> and I'm kind of guessing, and maybe I'm wrong, but the number reported by Sunrise Christian Food Ministry is what they've done through that agency as a whole. <laughs> um, and I would kind of, you know, in other words, for the amount of money we gave them, is that a, you know, 10% or 20% number of their overall budget? And that, to me, is a more realistic figure of, you know, in other words, the money that we're providing them, what is it serving? <laughs> they do a great job, but I, I'm probably guessing that our 20,000 did not serve 7,450 people. That was probably what the organization served. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, if so, they're doing a great job with our money. Everybody else is not. So <laughs> see what I'm saying? It's just <laughs> we actually double-checked on this figure. When we first got the report, we said, are you sure? <laughs> and they said, yes, uh, it's a combination of factors. Those are Citrusites residents. Uh, I think why the number is so high is because they are purchasing a lot of food, and there's no personnel costs that are going into this contract. Got it. Okay, and, and so, the people are coming to them, they're not delivering it, et cetera, like meals on wheels. Yeah, that's the big okay. difference, that it's just uh, cheese and bread and things like that. A lot that of are, cheese, a lot of bread. It is a lot but of that's cheese. That's great. <laughs> I mean, so but yes, we, we double-check that number. Okay. It is yeah. true. You don't, it said number served. I mean, we, didn't, we don't stop at 338 meals for the seniors. I mean, that's how many times a week? Times 338. Yes, so all year. these numbers represent unduplicated Citrus Heights residents. Okay. So it's basically head count. So it's head count. So those 338 seniors got served many meals right. over the course of the year. But that is the number of people. The number of meals okay. is substantially different. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's fine. I just want to make sure we were comparing apples. And yes, certainly. Half apples to cheese. That's fine. All right, so this is a public hearing. <clears throat> uh, I will open the public hearing to see if anybody wishes to comment on uh, these good numbers. Seeing nobody rushing to jump up and comment, I'll close the public hearing. And the matter before us is to direct staff to file the CAPER report with the U.S. Housing and Urban Development. Do we have... Well, We'll take a motion if somebody wants if, to. Make. If there's no questions or comments, I'd move the item. I have one. Okay, sorry, Mr. Daniels. Um, so the report doesn't require that you indicate how much you spent in each area? We deliver that information to HUD via our electronic system. Okay, so the answer is no. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. It's not outlined. It's just this is, a, this a is, yeah. yes, this is HUD's online template. They just want to know the number of people. They just want to know the number of people and then they get delivered the numbers through the system. Yeah, we deliver the numbers when we allocate it in the beginning, right? Yes. When we vote on it every year. Okay. Yeah. So, pleasure of the council. I move the item. Move the item. We have a second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Please uh, file it. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, for your report. And thanks for double checking that one because it stood out. All right, next item, please, Rhonda. Next item is regular calendar item number seven Sacramento Society for the Prevention and Cruelty of Animals, SSPCA Animal Shelter Services contract, presenting as um, Mary Poole. And Stephanie Cotter. Thank you, ladies. Yes, good evening. Stephanie Cotter, City Manager's Office, Mary Poole, General Services Department. So tonight we are here to follow up on the February 23rd study session wherein we discussed um, kind of our short-term uh, challenges and then some long-term options. Um, tonight we're going to talk, uh, review shortly, briefly about our existing challenges because we went into them in depth um, at the study session and we are going to present a short-term solution um, that we hope will will help to remedy some of our current challenges. An overview of our presentation, we're gonna start out with our recommendation um, and then go over briefly the current challenges. Um, we'll go over the key terms of the proposed contract and the benefits of that contract. And we'll review the analysis of all of the options uh, we looked at when we were examining this issue. 
and then uh, go over how we plan to provide, uh, ensure that services are provided locally because that is definitely uh, one of the things that we receive feedback on in the long-term planning session. And we will wrap up with any questions. The staff recommendation tonight, um, after conducting a comprehensive analysis of the options, um, again, this is related to short-term solutions to alleviate our, our ongoing contract challenges. Um, we currently contract with Sacramento County for animal shelter services. Um, and here we're requesting that we terminate that existing agreement and um, we're requesting a, that you adopt a resolution to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with um, Sacramento SPCA or SSPCA for animal shelter services effective uh, July 1st, 2017. Um, we would have to give a 90 day um, notice to the Sacramento County if you do choose to go with this option. A brief overview of the current challenges we discussed at the February 23rd study session. Despite efforts, continued efforts over the year to uh, collaboratively work with Sacramento County, um, we still have operational uh, significant challenges, um, both in, on the cost, that's the most significant cost, and operational inefficiencies, among um, many other challenges that we uh, have been experiencing and have not had any resolution um, uh, to fix them. This map shows the animal shelter locations uh, relative to citrus heights, the current and the proposed shelter locations. So the citrus heights is up at the top and the Bradshaw shelter is the next one down, the next box kind of in the middle. And that is the Sacramento County shelter that we currently contract with and it's located on Bradshaw Road in Sacramento. It's about 12.8 miles or 25 minutes from citrus heights. And then kind of to the bottom left is the Sacramento SPCA shelter. And that is our uh, proposed contract. That is where the shelter would be located on Florin Perkins Road in Sacramento, 18.1 um, miles from Citrus Heights and approximately 10 minutes further um, from our current shelter. So about 35 minutes to get there. This is a snapshot of the key terms um, included in the proposed contract with the Sacramento SPCA. This contract is structured um, as a three-year term with three options for one-year extensions. Um, the contract is split into two main categories, the base annual contract cost and then the additional expenses. Um, so uh, for year one, the base annual contract cost is $100,000 for the year up to 500 animals. The additional expenses include software at uh, $500 a month. Contract fees are about $210 a year. Um, for every additional animal over 500 animals, we would be charged uh, $210 per animal uh, over the 500. Uh, humane cases and protective custody, um, those are when the animals have to remain in the shelter for long periods of time because of a, in some sort of an investigation. And we would be charged $25 uh, a day for the humane cases and $20 a day per animal um, for the protective custody cases. Year two, our base cost would be 93,600 and our maximum animals would be 450. Um, if we go over that 450, they charge us uh, $220 per animal. So the same uh, categories of additional expenses, um, but the cost of the additional expenses um, uh, do go up uh, a little bit each year. Um, on the other hand, the base cost uh, goes down uh, in part because of the number of animals we're anticipating will go down. Um, and we do have a safeguard safeguard built in to where if we go over our estimated animals, um, we'll be charged on a per animal basis. Um, but we are hoping through our ongoing diversion efforts, we will continue the trend of reducing the number of animals um, that go to the shelter each year. Among the benefits of the proposed contract with Sacramento SPCA um, are 
uh, is cost stabilization is a big one. Um, there's a transparent fee structure. It's outlined in the contract, and we can anticipate um, to the best of our ability what the cost will be. Um, the additional expenses, uh, as you saw, really depends on um, uh, how many animals we get per year. It's hard to know for sure, um, but at least we have a fee structure that we can use our data to estimate um, and project out into the future what the costs will be from year to year. Um, in addition, we, we um, will receive increased revenue returns, um, less fees waived, so more uh, revenue coming back to offset the costs, help offset the costs of providing these services. Um, the, with the current contract, the animal service, services officers will have less intake requirements um, that they will have to undergo once they drop the animals off at the shelter, um, which will reduce the amount of time that they're there, which will increase the amount of time that they're in the city providing customer services. Um, residents will also have access to spay, neuter, and vaccination clinics. Um, and the Sacramento SPCA shelter has a managed intake philosophy, which means that they try to um, control intake uh, in order to prevent overpopulation of the shelter um, so that when people come in, they don't get turned away after um, coming uh, to the shelter. As I said, um, we did look at a number of options for short-term solutions. Um, these are all contract options. Um, the first column here is the Sacramento SPCA, which we just went over. Um, these costs are for year one of the agreement because as you saw, they do change slightly from year to year. So for year one of the Sacramento SPCA contract, uh, the base annual contract cost for 500 and 67 animals, and we used that number because we wanted to um, compare animals to animals, if you will, and so we wanted to make sure all these options, we use the same number of animals. Um, so that's where we got the 567. So for Sacramento SPCA, um, the base annual cost would be $114,000, uh, $114,70, and this is up to 500 animals. Um, any animal uh, over 500, we would pay $200 per additional animal. And then below are the additional expenses. Um, for Sacramento SPCA, uh, they're charging $6,000 per year in software costs, about $200 per year in contract administration fees, um, and as I stated before, $25 a day for humane cases and $20 for protective custody. Um, under the Sacramento County, so this is our existing contract, but this is their proposal. Um, we just received their proposal for next fiscal year. And under that proposal uh, for 567 animals, which is based on the number of animals uh, citricides took in last year, um, the range of the cost for Sacramento County is from $147,700 uh, to $189,800. And the reason why this number is a range is because um, they, the county hasn't finalized their budget yet, and so they can't provide us with a final number until they adopt their budget. Um, so we really won't know maybe until May um, what that number would really be, but those are the, the ranges they gave us. Um, additional expenses for Sacramento County, $5,000 per year um, for their software cost. Placer County SPA, SPCA is the third one we, uh, we looked at, and we base this on the contract um, that they have with Roseville right now. Um, that's where we received the information and we calculated it based on the number we were looking at. So they, their cost formula is a straight $300 per animal. Um, and based on that, times 567 animals, we're looking at about $170,000. Um, their additional costs um, are for $20 per day per animal for humane cases and $12 and $10 per day um, for protective custody for dogs and cats, respectively. Um, so this is a look of how they calculate the base and the additional expenses. And then this slide shows um, what the bottom line would look like. If you took the base cost and then you add those additional expenses, um, what could it really look like? And we uh, based the additional expenses on uh, 
fiscal year 15, 16 data. Um, so this is a full year of Citrus Heights data. To, but of course, it can change because it's really hard to predict the number of animals. Um, so with that, the Sacramento SPCA, the bottom line cost, um, base cost plus additional expenses, we would be looking at um, $129,680. Per year, well, I'm sorry, this is for year one of the contract. Sacramento County, their proposal um, for 1718, bottom line costs would be between 152,700 and 194,800. Uh, lastly, the Placer County SPCA, um, the admin, the uh, base cost plus the additional expenses would amount to $177,620 um, for the annual cost. And this is based on their current contract. Um, so all of these, it's a snapshot of what next year would look like. Um, they kind of have different variations as you go through the contract here. But just to give you an idea. Do you have any questions before we move on to the next slide? Because I know this is a question. <laughs> Speak nope. up. Certainly. A um, little curious, on our report, uh, Table 1-2 shows that it's $20 per animal for the county, and that's showing no cost on, on this chart? Yes. So we actually just got our, our new budget proposal for 1718 yesterday oh, okay. um, from the county. So we did plug in those numbers. Um, we were working off of the last uh, the last uh, fiscal oops, sorry the last fiscal year before. Um, so we updated it with the most recent numbers they provided us yesterday. Okay. So you're saying that the PowerPoint is more accurate than what we our staff report was from a few days ago. Yes. That's what I understood. Okay, so they, they eliminated some fees. Yes, they eliminated the um, 25, yeah, the $25 um, per day for those cases. So that one uh, did go down um, and the other numbers went up a little bit. So it's, okay. it's right. a little bit different. So we had 567 animals that went to animal jail. And do we know of the 567, how many got reunited with their owners? We don't have, I'm sorry. We don't have that information in front of us. We could provide that information to you. I, I think it's important because I think we also need to know, um, do we have repeat offenders? Yes, we um, do. do we charge anything? Obviously, uh, well, do we charge anything if we reunite the animal back to the owner since it cost us about $200 apparently? Right, yes, they're charged. There's different fees depending on their altered state, if they're licensed, if they've been there, if they're a repeat offender. So there's a different tier of fees, which we, the city council adopted that fee structure in December. And I, I didn't bring that tonight, but we do have those fees available that you could take a look at. We could provide those to you. Any idea, just approximately, since it's costing us $200, do you have any idea approximately um, what we might charge somebody? So $40, for example, for your first impound fee. Um, so if you went down to the shelter, you'd have to pay the kennel fees, the boarding fees of $10 a day, an impound fee of $40, nowhere near the $276.20 per day we're, per animal we're paying today, um, certainly nowhere near the any of the numbers that we're looking at from any of the shelter agreements. Um, the money comes to us or goes to the, the county right now? Or, or it goes, so any... Rev, any revenue collected from the prop, the animal owner at, at from the county or from any of the shelters does come back to the city. So we would get that forty dollars if if it was charged. If it was not waived, we would get it. One of our issues is that it's regularly waived. So how can that be if we set the fees? The contract with Sacramento County reserves the right to waive fees. Well, the heck with that. So they have they have how, how the much to, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, that okay. So then that begs the question on the SPCA. If we have a contract with them, this this uh, contract with SPCA also allows them the discretion to waive fees. However, they exercise that discretion in very infrequently, and that Good. was one of the the um, terms that we did okay. ask about. Fair with enough. Them. So yeah, 500 just, animals, $20, we're going to see very little. <laughs> very little, right. Yeah. Our goal is not to have them go to the shelter. That, As we talked about in the study session, we're really looking to find other ways to reunite pets with their owners without going to the shelter. 
this is not the best way from staff perspective or the community perspective or council direction to spend these dollars. And as we're looking for those ways, are we tied into a three-year contract now? This would be tied into a three-year contract with SPCA, but there is an option to uh, terminate just as we're proposing with county. It's 180 days with the SPCA. With county, it's 90 days. Okay. Thank you. So a couple, just a couple things. Go ahead. So with, account, with the SPCA, we have a base contract cost of $100,000, even if they only pick up one dog. Correct. So... Even if we only took one dog to SPCA, it would be $100,000. Um, we really tried to set the terms with the SPCA based on what we thought we would bring there. We have been steadily declining in numbers, going to the shelter from over 1,000 to 567 last year. So we set the number at 500, believing that we will continue to bring that number down. But as we get better and better at at returning animals to owners, there's still some number that is gonna be stray, is gonna be more difficult that we we haven't yet managed. And so we wanna be safe. We figure there's gonna be a, a, at least 500 that goes in. And you can see in the years that follow, we ratchet that down. Right. And because we think again, we're gonna to continue to be saving those funds and putting that money locally to return animals, identify them, licensing, microchipping, getting them back to their owners without going to the shelter. That's our last resort. Right. So is, I, I appreciate that, and I know that that is our goal. Um, is there an opportunity, if we, t if we had a sudden, let's just say this year our, our animals count decreased dramatically, and it looked like it was going to continue to go down, is there any opportunity to renegotiate this so that, we're not paying $100,000 for 200 animals, let's say, because that brings the cost per animal up to $500 per animal. Right. Know, There's not in the current agreement. There isn't a clause that says if some, um, you know, something extraordinary happened and we we didn't meet those that target by a significant number that we can renegotiate. It is something we could certainly discuss with them and see in the interest of justice, we could um, include that. Okay, and I know we have some long-term goals to um, come up with a permanent solution, maybe partial ownership and all of that. So, but those long-term goals aren't going to even uh, begin until after this three-year contract, as far as implementing them. Right. So that's actually the the next slide kind of talks about, for example, Placer County SPCA, that's that's kind of the natural thought that would we partner with them. We haven't had formal discussions with Placer County SPCA, but what we do know is that there is, would be a requirement for some type of capital investment, which based on the number of animals that we're currently dealing with would be on the, in the order of 15 to 20% of their, the cost of their shelter, which is running between um, two and 2.5 million for the first phase. So we are looking at Placer County SPCA as a potential option in the future when we have identified some type of funding that could contribute to that buy-in, which was talked about at the study session, because that is one of the options that we, we talked about exploring further. I guess I'm curious about the potential Citrus Heights share being six to 800 animals when we're actually working to reduce the number of animals. Well, that's another reason. We're, we're, again, trying to work apples to apples, animals to animals. That's kind of the number we've been, been running. And so just to be on the conservative side, if we, if, if we have the same amount of animals that we're handling, plus with proximity, folks are going to be more likely to go to that shelter. So that number, there could be some fluctuation there that actually increases the number of animals that residents take there versus what might be going into the other shelters. So we're just trying to be conservative and look at what the potential uh, cost could be and not have any surprises. But with this three-year contract, that does allow us to really get our arms around what, are, what is a, a more realistic number, and we would expect to see it go down when the time comes to actually start those negotiation discussions with Placer, if, that's a, if that is a direction you direct us to go. Additional questions? How, how would that phase one be paid over time? Could, or 
three or, or four years out. We have no idea. No, no. I mean, is it a lump sum that they'd be expecting of the 15 to 20 percent? Or So we haven't had formal discussions, but no, it no. sounded like there would be a range of options uh, that we could look at as long as the funds were contributed. Under Roseville's contract with the SBCA, they paid um, uh, 68 per, because they have 68 percent ownership. So they paid 68 um, percent of the cost that they had incurred up to when they decided to come in, and then they pay 60 percent of the cost on an ongoing basis. So as billed, uh, they pay 68 percent, and then they have a cap of 7.6 million. Um, so if the 68 percent ends up going over 7.6 million, um, they don't pay anything over. But if it's under, they reimburse them. Um, it was a lump for, sum they had to pay. Uh, a lump sum for the cost they've already incurred and then ongoing as they incur additional costs. So this shelter is under construction. Right. So that's, okay. that's how that okay. all happened. So and then likely by the time we were ready, their phase two would be under discussion, if not further Got along it. than that. So that needs to also be part of our evaluation at going forward and that we would come back to you and present those details. Okay. So that's the Placer County item that we wanted to share with you. And then just to reiterate that our goal, again, is not, it doesn't matter what shelter it is, our goal is not to take the animals there. We want to reunite animals with their owners without going to the shelter. So we're continuing to look at our local options, do our diversion efforts, our rescues, our fosters, our social media, encouraging just responsible pet ownership, the vaccinations, the microchipping, and it's been paying off. It really has been making a difference with the community and our partners in the community and our animal services officers and our staff. So um, we're, we're excited about the opportunity to potentially move forward with this agreement. Well, thank you, ladies, for your presentation. I know, Mary, you've been involved in this field since the beginning. It, you know, it's costs have been continuing to go up. I, I know the options. I mean, yes, it's a little bit less money under the option. It's a little further, but I, I think the SPCA is a little better organization, no offense, than the county. So th there's that. You know, from my end, it's a little frustrating to know that, you know, whether it's 500, whether it's 800 animals, <coughs> that all the citizens are subsidizing, you know, forget the strays, because those are going to be out there. But, you know, my dog goes in and I complain and I don't have to pay a penny when I pick them up because some nice person waived it. You and I, as taxpayers, are still paying for my ignorance or, you know, whatever. That's frustrating to me. Um, but, you know, you can't just let them run wild either. So I, I, it's just, I don't know what the right answer is, except I appreciate the fact that you're looking for... Um, humane treatment, but maybe at a little less cost. This does that. The only question I have is if we say, we say yes, we go forward, you give your 90 days to the county. <laughs> We're st under our current contract with them, so there's n we pretty much know what the cost will still be under that period of time. There's no right. shenanigans that they can pull. And right. No, and they've been really, I mean, Stephanie mentioned the word collaborative. They really have worked with us the best that they could okay. and have yeah, their hands they have too. done the, their best to get their costs down for us it's just it just simply hasn't from our from staff perspective okay this is a better deal fair enough any additional questions from the council this is not a public hearing. yes sir um you mentioned that the uh, distance was further and it took a little more time to get there but um i'm also assuming that the intake time is going to be less and it's Significantly. Okay, that was significantly on the order of probably 45 minutes or more time savings by by utilizing the SPCA versus Sacramento County. Okay, thank you. Just just curious, you know, we use volunteers for many areas of the city. Is there any way to consider volunteers uh, for transporting animals? It's something that we could look into. There's a a lot of um, issues around handling animals and probably some risk management issues that we'd want to look at. Um, Fair enough. But it is certainly something we can look at. tell them to behave, put them in the car and drive them there. <laughs> yeah, belt them in. <laughs> okay, vision's a grandeur. What's the thought? All right, what's the pleasure of the council? I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Anybody wishing to abstain? Motion carries 4-0. Next item, Rhonda. Next item is department reports. First one is a, an update on the 20th anniversary block party. 
Uh, Rhonda Rivera just wanted to give a quick update on where we are with our block party. And so just to let you know, we um, a reminder, the city is in contract with Darlene Lyons with Easy Event. She's helping us with planning this event for the block party. The block party, again, is a free celebration that will occur on Saturday, June 3rd Van, at the Van Maren Park over here, and it is free. We have already procured the kids zone, which will include crafts, face painting, inflatables, a climbing rock wall, and then there will be some strolling entertainment. We will be having a car show with close to 100 vehicles that um, have enrolled and registered for the event. And just let you know that half of the proceeds for the registration of each vehicle to be in the car show, half of it will go to CH Pal. We're very grateful for that. We will have several commercial vendors, several food court vendors. Um, we have a beer garden, and the beer garden will be operated by um, the American Legion Post 637, and they will receive half of the proceeds for that. We will have three stages. Headlining will be Pablo Cruz and then the Boys of Summer. And um, we've had um, some pretty cool events happen just recently. We, we contacted one of our neighborhood, one of the neighborhood meetings, they made a recommendation that the city explore having some bike lockers available at the park. So when we started contacting around and getting a hold of people, we had one vendor who said, you know, we can do one better than that. We'll provide you a, a free bike valet. And so what they do is they come out and they will set up a secured area. You drop off your bike, you get a ticket, they have someone there, they park it for you, they watch it for you. And then when you're done, you bring your ticket back and you get your bike. So we're really excited about that. Um, we have the shuttle set up to come from Bayside Church and drop people off over here on Stock Ranch. And then we have the ADA parking will be at the police parking lot and we'll have golf, golf carts to shuttle people down here to the main event. Just wanted to kind of let you know that we currently have nine sponsors, but we still need more. Uh, again, our goal is to make this a free event for the community, and it will be free. Um, but the more sponsors we have, the more advertising they get, and the less cost that um, will be borne by the city. And we have um, been notifying the residents at Stock Ranch area, let them know what's going to be going on with the, the traffic plan. We've sent out a flyer already from our general services department and the day of the event, because the roads will be closed down, we will have people within this, the residential community will be provided with two parking pass per household. And the only way that they can get back into their neighborhood is if they have that residential path, what we're pass, what we're trying to do is to keep the vehicle flow and parking, street parking, out of the neighborhoods because we're trying to impact the neighbors as, as little as possible. We've done one outreach. We will be doing some more, and then again, we will be doing the passes. I've been going around to the different neighborhood meetings and providing information, getting some feedback, and, and just trying to hear, again, what our citizens and our residents want because this is their event, celebrating our incorporation of our city. So we've been trying to get as much as we can from them. And just to let you know some of our needs, we still need more sponsors. As I said, we need volunteers for the day of the event. Uh, we need some more commercial vendors and also nonprofits. There's a different rate for each one. And if you would like more information or to fill out a volunteer, sponsor, or vendor form, you can visit citrusheightsblockparty.net or contact Darlene Lyons at ezevents.net. Her number, 916-726-7404. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Rhonda. I, I know Jeannie has one. A couple of them. Would you name the bands again that are going to be showcasing? Um, Pablo Cruz okay. and Boys of Summer. The Boys of Summer do an Eagles tribute. Okay. And then you mentioned the car show. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you have all the cars you can take or is that? It's still open. Okay. Are, can, those, are those individual people or is it a car club or? I think it's a combination of all of that. Okay. Okay. You Thank you. You want to put your Honda in? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, my, my Honda Accord, my 12-year-old Honda Accord, yeah. I have a couple people I know that would probably be interested. That would be good. And then they can apply online? Yes. Get the car in? Okay. Any questions down on this end? Okay. Uh, two, one, you talked about sending a flyer out for the neighborhood. Well, <clears throat> the reality is people, not everybody's going to park at Bayside. Some are going to park at Sam. Some are going to go over to the gym, et cetera. So are, are we also just notifying them so that there's... 
yes. no problems there? Okay. Yes, we've been in contact with them. All right, and then lastly, it's not, it doesn't need to be answered. It's just really a comment uh, for our uh, police department. You know, when we look at, uh, like the event that happened in London and others where people have been using their weapons as cars, you know, we're talking about having the streets closed, but, you know, putting a bunch of cones out is one thing to block the traffic. So I just hope as we look at whatever the measures are going to be, we're, you know, trying to keep the people safe too, so. Yeah. And that, just to follow up on that, I know for the people that live there, we're going to have one uh, path of ingress and egress. Is that going to have a patrolman there to check their passes? So it will be manned. I'm not sure by what person. Okay, not a patrolman per se, but there it will be It'll monitored be, by yes. a human being. Yes, there will be a human being. There. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Yes, exciting. What are the hours again? It's from three until eight. And the, the roads will be closed down at noon to allow for setup and for the vendors to come in and get the stages and the kids zone. And um, we are doing a lot of marketing and public, and so we're hoping to get three, about 3,000 people or more to come in to this event. Um, but again, the roads will shut down at 12. The event starts at three. Dignitaries such as yourselves will, not, will um, launch that about three o'clock. And then it will go until eight. So we'll open up the beer garden about 3 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> about 2.30. All right. Next item, please. Rhonda, thank you for that update. Good. Um, I, next item is also a department report, update from the Citrus Heights Police Department on potential impacts of 2016 public safety propositions. Welcome, Chief Lawrence. I'm hoping, do you, is it queued up? Oh, I see it here. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Proud to present to you the uh, 2016 propositions and laws impacting public safety in Citrus Heights. Uh, you probably recall in 2016 in October during our strategic planning session for the city under enhanced public safety, one of the goals was for the police chief to report to City Council on potential impacts of public safety propositions that passed in November of 2016 election. So this report tonight is intended to uh, satisfy that, that goal. Before I talk about the propositions, though, one of the things I wanted to add to this report was uh, through the California Police Chiefs Association, just a very high-level overview of some of the other things we pay attention to legislatively at the state capitol, uh, not just propositions, but uh, some other things that uh, would potentially impact public safety. Uh, with the idea of giving you the confidence of knowing the types of things we pay attention to that could be potential impacts to our community that we would then therefore bring to your attention uh, for your consideration. The California Police Chiefs Association, for example, in 2015-16 legislative season tracked 234, 234 bills through the state capitol. And in a legislative season 16-17, we tracked 325 bills pertaining to public safety. Now, as a point of reference, uh, this chart here shows the assembly and senate totals for the first year, 15-16, were 2,772, that first column. The second column were the bills tracked by the Police Chiefs Association, uh, about 234 bills. The second year, which was FY 1617, uh, there was 2,331 bills pushed through the state capitol. Of those, uh, 325 had some impact to public safety that we tracked. Some of the, well, the three that uh, I chose to share with you today is uh, of significant legislative bills last year um, that that were really important for us and things that I think will um, are important for us to understand in Citrus Heights. First one is Senate Bill 813, Sex Offenses Statute of Limitations. This bill eliminates many uh, statute of limitations for certain felony sex crimes. And this bill was introduced as a result of the several accusations against actor and comedian Bill Cosby, uh, many of which would have fallen outside the statute of limitations if not passed. This is important to us because these types of cases are extremely difficult to investigate due to the time that lapses. But if there's a statute of limitations, it makes it impossible to prosecute. So this will, will help us uh, with that effort. So, so Chief, does that mean it's extending the statute? Is that what that is? Removing them. So Removing, there's, okay. There is Got no it. statute Thank of limitations. Uh, Assembly Bill 1785, this has to do uh, to clarify that it's, it's, it is against the law to hold and operate a cell phone while driving. A ruling in 2014 found that California's original law uh, only applied to texting 
uh, it didn't apply to smartphone devices or certain applications like mapping applications. So this uh, bill uh, clarified that by specifying that it applies to individuals holding and operating um, their phones. So this will help us uh, in the enforcement of traffic and, and distracted driving um, accidents. Assembly Bill 2298 is a little bit more complicated and without getting into it too much, this is just changing the way we do business with regards to tracking uh, criminal gangs. We use uh, databases for that, criminal intelligence databases, specifically Cal gangs. And throughout the state now, this has mandated that uh, all of those who are put into this database uh, determined to be gang members, uh, validated gang members, have to be reported to the Department of Justice. Those individuals now have a process by which they can apply uh, through the courts to get off of that system. Um, what's happened, though, is that it's become administratively uh, challenging and expensive for those agencies that did hold the, uh, the databases. So some of them are opting out of that process because of the cost. So we're still working through this one. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to end up, but um, it's certainly been a challenge. The two propositions that... Uh, I wanted to hone in on the ones that would potentially be an impact for us are Prop 57 and then, of course, Prop 64. And this isn't really to get into the weeds of debating the merit one way or the other, but just to make sure that you know what we're seeing uh, and you can give us uh, your guidance as, as you so desire. Prop 57 uh, states that certain state prison inmates convicted of nonviolent felony offenses would be considered for release earlier than otherwise. The state prison system could award additional sentencing credits to inmates for good behavior and approved rehabilitative or educative uh, incentives. Uh, this grants the politically appointed Board of Parole hearings full authority over release decisions once an inmate has served their base time, which only covers punishment for the primary offense. So it doesn't include enhancements for gang ties, drug dealings, use of weapons, or repeat offenders. The enhancements that were uh, enacted by law or votes over the last, say, 20 or 25 years. Those essentially now are at the discretion of the parole board. Impacts to Citrus Heights and Sacramento County in general are still largely unknown for this proposition because it really hasn't been uh, implemented at this point. Uh, however, my assessment is that typically about a third of those paroled from state prison belong to the LA County area. Uh, so the lion's share of the impact of this proposition is going to be in Southern California, although because we're close to Sacramento and a major metropolitan area, we will have some fallout from it. Uh, the, the District Attorneys Association had placed an estimated 16,000 prisoners would be released early. Um, their assessment didn't necessarily give a timeline, but uh, our information from the Department of Corrections has indicated that this proposition will result in several thousand early releases in the first two years of implementation, which we believe will begin uh, very, sh very soon. And then Prop 64, I won't spend a whole lot of time on because I think most people know uh, the ins and outs of this, the California Marijuana Legislative Initiative, but in a nutshell, the possession of less, the, this legalized the possession of less than one ounce uh, of marijuana for those 21 and over, makes it illegal for anyone 21 and over to grow a maximum of six plants indoors. However, local jurisdictions can still regulate and mandate that they be indoors and not in public view. Uh, offensive, offenses by minors up to the age of 18 are now uh, result in infraction and require counseling, community service, and drug education. Of course, driving under the influence of marijuana still remains illegal, uh, but that still presents challenges for us because it's hard to detect, and there is no uh, court-approved technology at this point, as we spoke about at the last council meeting, that really helps us do field sobriety tests and there's no per se limits for marijuana either in California, whereas with alcohol, there's the 0.08 per se limit. Uh, with marijuana, that just doesn't exist uh, yet. Of course, I personally have concerns about access um, uh, by our youth, our kids, uh, as marijuana becomes more, um, I'll say, normalized or prevalent. I think that uh, we'll start to see a rise in uh, possession of marijuana by youths, uh, particularly in and around our schools. I'm concerned about edibles, edible infused uh, with marijuana, cookies, candies, uh, that some might be targeted to uh, younger audiences, and then, of course, overdoses. Uh, but truth be told, there's not been enough time lapsed for us to take a good analysis on what this impact means to us. Um, I can tell you that our, our ordinance here is very sound. I'm, I'm very happy with our ordinance. It's structured, structured in such a way that uh, I think we've mitigated just about everything we can. I say we, you, because it was enacted before I got here. Um, it's, a, it's a good ordinance. The, the one area we are looking at is our park district uh, because the 
the proposition makes it illegal to smoke marijuana in public, but we want to make sure that the park district has uh, enforceable ordinances for their areas to ensure that it's very clear that the parks are public also. I mean, that's, to us, that's kind of common sense, but we want to make sure that that's clearly denoted in their, their uh, ordinances. So on the horizons, things we're paying attention to, uh, reclassifying serious felonies as violent under Prop 57 to ensure that crimes such as rape and of an unconscious person do not qualify for early release. Um, bail reform uh, to, to eliminate monetary bail. This one's an interesting one because it's not just California. This is a nationwide narrative. I had an opportunity to represent the California Police Chiefs Association with the, uh, at the international association's level uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. And this really is taking a look at um, pre-trial release, so somebody that instead of being released on bail from uh, on a monetary scale, uh, they would be subjected to a, an analysis or, or assessment of their likelihood to reoffend or their criminogenic uh, likelihood to reoffend, and then um, bail or release pre-trial would be contingent upon that rather than a monetary uh, release. This one promises to be a huge debate at the Capitol. We'll see uh, where that goes. And then lastly. Assembly Bill 1326 has been mentioned. Uh, we talked about it at the last council meeting. Uh, council Member Bruins brought it up then and, and again this evening uh, is a, uh, an attempt to address some of the property crimes issues that uh, were unintended consequences of Prop 47. It looks at an aggregate of a 12-month period that uh, theft of more than $950 within that rolling 12-month period could be considered a felony. And we do have coming to you uh, on the next council meeting, April 13th, um, a staff report and a resolution for your consideration to support Assemblyman Cooper's Bill um, 1326. With that, I know that was very high level, and I thank you and uh, certainly answer any questions you might have. Questions for the Chief? No. <clears throat> Chief, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you to thank the officers, and particularly the school resource officers for the <clears throat> fine handling of the gun at the campus. Last week uh, could have been a much different result, so uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Yes, thank you for the report. You can check that one off your list on your little matrix. <laughs> Next item, please. Next item, um, city manager items, of which there are none. That would leave items requested by council members, future agenda items. <clears throat> So, Jeannie, since they're bringing a resolution back on the Cooper thing, I'm good that, with that. Okay. We, then we don't need a letter. We'll just wait right. for the resolution. Is that right? All right. Anything from up here? All right. With that, we'll go ahead and close the meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>